this is where we start. Out in the galaxies where the light originated, star children, and if you look at the stars with the naked eye, you'll say they're all white, aren't they? But it's an illusion due to the distance, because any luminous object becomes white at a sufficient distance. But if you look close through a telescope, you see it's brightly colored. This is a swan, for example. So usually stars, galactic clouds, newborn stars, are closely monochromatic. They have a very definite spectrum of radiation but we cannot tell it with the naked eye. But it is known that all origins of biological and molecular life originated from stars. So we are star seed. And this is the origin of light and color. It starts way out in the galactic branches. Here is another one. There again we see very <coughs> brightly colored. Because a dictum often goes that the colors in nature are bland and soft and subdued, but in a way, some of them are very, very bright. And it has been known for a long time that humans and animals are very strongly attracted to bright, saturated colors. That the ancient cultures never appreciated dull earth colors because they wanted them very strong because color is information. So it's like talking homeopathy. The purer the remedy, the stronger the information, so to say. And then we land on a tiny planet out the fringes of the galaxy. So this is violent territory. It's a blue planet, known as the blue planet. And looking at it, we are the first generation ever to see our Earth from space. So it's also a science fiction story we're entering into. It. So every living being on this planet is bathed in blue. Seen from space, it's a gem, it radiates, it has an atmosphere, and it has oceans. Very few known planets have liquid water. There are liquid oceans probably on the moon Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, but the oceans are made of frozen methane. So <laughs> liquid water is very rare, and our biosystem rests on water. So all color phenomena that we experience are largely based upon water, and we being from 60, 70, 80, 90 percent water, depending on your age, we dehydrate as we get old. Mm. So babies are highly liquid, but we get like raisins when we get old. <laughs> we tend to dry up. Yeah. But it also means that water is highly electromagnetic. It interacts with light, which again is an electromagnetic medium. It also means that we humans are actually liquid crystals. Large amounts of liquid in membranes, multiple membranes of multiple refractions. And then you look at a riddle. That's the first riddle we're really. looking at galactic light, planetary light. What is the speed of light? 380,000 kilometers. If you go metric. And that is in vacuum. But I hope your brains are not a vacuum, dear friend. So in organic tissue, biological tissue, which is like liquid crystal, it is known that the speed of light is very close to zero. In a ruby crystal, the speed of light is 50 meters per second, which is the speed of a motor car. And in a liquid crystal, which is humans, you have multiple reflections in membranes, you get standing wave oscillations, and the speed of light stands still. So when you talk photobiology, we're not dealing with vacuum anymore, we're dealing with living beings. And that's a very different step we're taking. Clouds, vapor. So this is the light, the background light, the scattered light that nourished and fed us. And I personally don't believe that blue light is that bad but then we would have died long ago. It's been around us for quite a while, this beautiful blue planet. So there's more to blue light than the naughty and bad, but that's not the chapter. And the sun, the powerhouse of this stellar system where we live. So all biological life forms are nourished by this energy source. And it's a mystery how it actually works. The age of the sun is estimated 10 billion years. The age of the Earth is just half. It's 5 billion years across the model. 
But through nuclear reactions, this energy is slowly fed through the stellar system. It takes, from the center of the sun to reach the surface of the sun, it takes the light one million years to come out. It bounces back and forth and eventually, through Brownian motion, reaches the surface. It takes a million years for light to escape from the mother sun. Think about that. Or the moon. These were the only natural light sources when we were young. Sunlight and moonlight. And when the sun went down, you might have moonlight and that was all. Moonlight, you'd say, is only reflective sunlight. And it is and it isn't because moonlight is polarized <coughs> light. The moment you get reflected light, it usually goes polarized. And it's known that polarized light has very interesting biological properties. It's also known that it influences, it resonates differently in biological tissue. And it's also known that the lunar cycle of 28 to 29 days usually closely correlates to the female menstrual cycle. So it's a biological clock that rules you ladies. Your body system is largely ruled by a planetary body that reflects polarized light. <coughs> It was known, and it's been forgotten, but these are the first steps going into photobiology. Why is it so important? What is hiding in here? What's so special about moonlight? And people get lunatic. And this was known that around the time of full moon, people got mad because the liquids from the brain started to resonate, of course. And unless it was closely stabilized, it wouldn't work. Here comes the next step. Carl Albert spoke about it already. So this parallels it. One and a half million years ago comes the first artificial light source, heat source. And this is the first step from being primitive animals to becoming humans. First step of civilized man who learns how to use light because it was a source of heat, it was a source of light. It also meant security. Animals were afraid of the fire. It meant cooking. It meant civilization. This meant getting breakfast instead of becoming breakfast. That's a vast yeah. difference, really. Yeah. So this is the first step into the light age where we live today. But it meant like people would go to bed, and if they didn't have any light, they would have to do without it. Because just imagine to make up a fire. You don't make it in a second or two. Because the next step eventually came. domesticated fire, to use it in matches, in lamps, in torches, in candles. And this was the only light source for a million years or more. So getting very close in history now comes the artificial electrical light. No, there is one intermediate step. It was harvesting using light. Because you say, well, couldn't they use windows? Well, they could, because these are old window panes. But you notice that they are not transparent. So transparent glass was not invented until recently. This is Roman window panes. <coughs> so the Romans used window glass, but it was not very transparent. You would get light, but seen through a glass darkly. That's the saying, in that the ancient glass was very dark, very murky. So sitting inside of a room, you wouldn't get much daylight and you would use firelight, artificial light. But it went on. Now comes the picture. <laughs> <laughs> the first electrical bulbs, Swan Edison, there was a German inventor also involved here. Some names have been forgotten. But the very first electrical bulbs <coughs> were fitted into gas chandeliers. So looking at it, you say, this is gas light. They fitted in exactly the same gas burners that were around, and they fitted an electrical bulb. And people were afraid of the new electric light. Was it dangerous? Was it toxic? And the very first electric bulbs, they would try to use a match to light it up. <laughs> because they were unfamiliar with the fact that you shouldn't use a match. And it came more and more. reading lamps, and please note the green lampshade. 
because we are forest animals, we are pack monkeys. We lived in that forest for millions of years, and it's nothing like green to suit our eyes. So reading, writing, welding, what have you, give green to your good eyes. It's a restorative, it's a tonic, and it's been known for a long while. So the old lamps were eventually fitted with green. And these are the first generations, but they came more. The neon light, the fluorescent light, came around 1910. Extensive use in 1920, 1930. And we are the first neon generations, really the first electrical generation, so to say. This is cold light, because you can touch a fluorescent tube, you can touch a neon tube, and say, it isn't that hot. And the technician will say, but well, it's 5,000 degrees Kelvin, but it doesn't have a temperature of that. These are the cold light sources. They are, in, they are um, discharged, meaning that you actually have sparks, tiny intermittent sparks, at a tremendous speed that you cannot perceive. It also means that some young, yeah? was there a question? Do interrupt if you need to make questions. It means that these light sources are very new to our biosystem. They oscillate at a very rapid rate, and many epileptics, many electroallergic cases will react to it and will not enjoy it. And here is another object fiber optics, and we're approaching modern age. So, just like you can hose water in a hose, you can actually hose light in a cable made of plastic or glass or quartz or could be made out of synthetics. It could also be made out of membrane tissue. This could be a protein tissue. Connective tissue acts like fiber optics. So large parts of our body are fiber optics. And this is known in acupuncture, in light puncture, color puncture, that you can apply a light source and you will see the light energy coming out somewhere else. So you just pipe it down the hose. So we are like large pipes, actually. And I gave a new step, the LEDs, light-emitting diodes. Well, light is generated not by classical optics, but it's actually generated by annihilation. An electron meets what's known as a hole. And when an electron combines with its mirror image, it just becomes pure energy. So this is a light source. Anadi will also show you a lot about this. Experiments, what you can do with LEDs. Nobody had ever seen this before. An efficiency rate that is untold of. Purity, direction. And then there was a step more. Here it starts. This is Theodore Maiman, Californian technician. He worked in Palo Alto. Bell Technology Laboratories, he invented around 1960 a light source that was revolutionary. Einstein spoke about it, but never lived to see it. And that was a laser. Light amplification by stimulated emitted radiation. You needn't remember, but it's an acronym. So he invented by stimulated radiation a light source of a purity that no one had ever seen. He passed away two years ago, so Theodore is gone, but his gift to us is still here. So we are the first laser children. Nobody has ever seen this before. So first, these were technological toys. They were used for welding. You could cut metal like butter with a laser. You could measure the distance to the moon with half an inch precision. You could gauge, you could cut, you could drill, you could make holograms. Fascinating. So the technicians were fascinated for 10 years. Metallurgy. First years, 60 till 70, was entirely technological. Several lasers were developed. These were the first ones, the ruby lasers. The resonator, the cavity crystal was a ruby. And like I said, the speed of light in a ruby is only 50 meters per second. So the light slows down behaves in a very different manner when it slows down. Small pocket lasers became available. You can buy them any place. Larger lasers. This is used for dentistry, sports medicine. 
These are laser LEDs radiating in red and infrared. Swedish engineer made it. It's used for sports medicine. You put it on knees and elbows. It's used in geriatric care because it eventually showed that laser light was biologically very interesting. First step towards biological use of laser is coming here. The laser LEDs or here is a diffused laser. Alexander made this one actually. Because many will say, but isn't laser dangerous? Well, if you focus it, it will cut. Just like sunlight. Take the sun through a burning glass and man does it burn. But if you diffuse the laser, it will not. Then you will speak about a soft laser or a cold laser or a bio laser or a mid laser. The names are many. And the standard term today is low level laser. We will start to speak about low level laser therapy, LLLT, is today the standard name. But the lasers could be diffused, but they were always red. But eventually they came more. So the resonators <coughs> were not only crystals, they could be gases, they could be liquids, they could be actually any medium. So a modern laser can range in orange or blue or violet or ultraviolet or green being used for medical care. Dentists will use it. Dermatologists will use it. Removing warts, skin, burns, blisters, what have you. So this interesting light is a property that we are the first ones to see. It's also known that if you remove a blister or a wart, it will not cause any scar tissue. It will not bleed because you will regenerate new tissue with laser light. We will look closer at that. Here comes Professor Mestre, Andre Mestre in Budapest, Hungarian professor in medicine. He started to ask the question, these lasers, do they have biological properties? Are they dangerous? Do they cause cancer? What are the biological and medical qualities of this new super light? And Andre Mestre, he's dead today, his sons are still working in Budapest, started to work with rats. Experiment. These are pictures from his original works. So he would first shape them, and then he would burn them and cut them and bruise them in good traditional medical tradition. <laughs> scientific work here. Yeah. So the poor little animals were burned to cut. And you see the burns here. Then he irradiated the wounds and the fractures with laser light, with a soft laser, low level laser. And he would find out that. The wounds healed up very quickly. The skin grew back very quickly. You would find that fractured bones radiated with a laser would heal up ever so fast. New skin was made, so the burns were quickly regenerated. New tissue was regenerated. And we will eventually find that laser work stimulates the creation, the proliferation of new tissue. Laser will create new DNA. It will repair damaged DNA in the body systems of animals. So that's where it started. But then he also looked into the nervous system of the rats and found that the nervous system, not only skin tissue, bone tissue, hair tissue, protein tissue, reacts to the light information, but nerve tissue is particularly susceptible to the information because nerves have long dendrites, fingers, and they act fiber optically. So this information is now transmitted between the nerves. And each healthy nerve typically has 10,000 dendrites. And in a brain, you typically have 10 up to the 11th power, 10 up to 12th power of cells each cell having 10,000 connections. So the number becomes astronomical. The information processing in the nervous system, which is guided by light, becomes astronomical. Here is a slice of brain tissue. You see the nuclei of the cells. You see the dendrites, the axons, the connections. And he found that laboratory rats that were irradiated, so he fixed the poor animals, radiated brain and body with light. And he let the rats run in a maze, in a labyrinth. And he found that laser rats were a lot brighter than ordinary rats. They would find the food. 
They would avoid the punishment. They would always find a way through the labyrinth a lot faster than the dull, non-irradiated rats. So he said that there's something special about the brain tissue. So he cut the brains off and looked at them. And noticed that the density inside the brain was a lot higher. The amount of cells will usually be the same. So we have the same amount of cells, but the ramifications, all the dendrites, are a lot tighter. You get like a healthy tree, like a healthy shrub, you have much more connections. So the next step, he says, yes, these rats are much more intelligent. They're clever rats. <laughs> <laughs> you their trick. Because this guy's brain is still in a jar <laughs> university. They kept it and wanted to see what was special about it. And he has typically 50% more dendrites than an ordinary brain has. And it was found that the laser rats are typically 50% more dendrites than the ordinary rats. So light is like a software to the brain. This is one of the bottom lines. We usually have good brains. Our clients have good brains, and we have two. But we've got lousy software. And a computer is not better than its software. So how do we upgrade rat brains and or human brains with light? Because my trade is psychology, not so much dermatology. But how can humans start using their brains properly? Because here at the outer fringes of the galaxy, they barely started to grow. This is a very primitive terrain, and we have to become more intelligent, otherwise our planet is in problem. And the modality will probably be light, but there is much more to it. This is Tina Kao, professor in Moscow, laser biologist. Now we come into the 80s. So she started to ask herself questions. Having studied Gurvich, having studied the work of Mesca, she would ask herself, where does the light go? This is Kirlian work. She worked in Moscow. She's Estonian. But Semyon and Valentina Kirlian, who had studied the work of Gurevich, had noticed that healthy tissue radiates. But usually in a non-visible part of the spectrum or in a sub-visible part of the spectrum that you need to amplify in order to see it. And it's actually like the fur of the healthy rats. So the longer your electric fur, the healthier the person. That's the Kirlian diagnosis. Peter Mandel will use it. And you can make a fingerprint and say, yes, that's a healthy person. Because the electric fur is very robust. Whereas an unhealthy person will have a weak energetic field. So not only do we eat light, like plants, we actually, we actually radiate light. We transduct it and metabolize light. So that was the background. These are my front paws covering a 40 watt bulb. And you say, but well, light doesn't penetrate very deeply, or does it? So a 40 watt bulb will penetrate an inch or two of bone and flesh. 40 watts. Imagine what happens if you go out into the sun. Which means we are transparent. We don't realize it really, but Light, strong light, will penetrate into the heart, lung tissue. All your organs are saturated with light. Medical studies have been made showing that light penetrates into the uterus of the unborn child, being transparent. And the uterus, the child in the uterus, feeds on the light information. So thus, during pregnancy, never wear black, ladies, because it will kill the child more or less. Don't wear too much black anyway, because since we are transparent, like liquid crystals, we need to fill up our batteries. <coughs> Here is a brain transmission scan. Brain particular transmissors. The brain tissue is highly transparent. It's very rich in fatty acids, and we will see it's very rich in fatty tissue and also fiber optically reactive. One of the most transmissive, one of the most uh, transparent tissues of the body is actually the brain. And experiments have been made putting a light source at one temple and a photomultiplier at the other, and you will see that light just passes through. 
So Professor Carroll would say, but in this transparent tissue, where does the light go? Brain tissue, highly transparent. So we look into the cell structure. There again, we're getting familiar with the cell now. Because it's known that since we are transparent, most of the light is lost. It just passes through us. It's like eating. It just goes <laughs> straight through. But some is actually harvested. Some of the light is harvested in the cell structure. And she asked the questions. This is mid-80s. She said, I have a theory. It is probably in the mitochondria that the light is harvested. In the large modern cell, known as a eukaryotic cell, we are made out of eukaryotic cells. This is a very modern cell type. We have compartments. The mitochondria are the powerhouses, the reactors. They make us warm, they make us perspire, they make us breathe. We need to breathe because the mitochondria consume a lot of oxygen. Like any furnace, we need oxygen to burn. But you have the Golgi apparatus and you have the nucleus with the DNA being rolled up, curled up inside the nucleus of the cell. And let's look further at this strange cell structure. Because in this tiny nucleus, we have the spiral DNA. And in each body cell, we typically have two meters of DNA. Can you imagine? in 10 up to 14 cells in the body. So the total amount of DNA in a human body makes eight loops around the moon or something like that. Enormous, absolutely enormous. This vast information is part of us, and it feeds on light somehow. So in order also to repair damaged cells, because this is like a zip, a double zip, but it tends <coughs> to turn up. So the toxins, virus, heavy radiation, hard radiation, like heavy ultraviolet, gamma radiation, nuclear radiation, the zip tends to jam. And it can no longer open, it can no longer read with RNA, and the information gets locked. If you have sufficient number of breaks in the strands, eventually the organism will disintegrate, and that's it. So you say, but can't we repair it? Yes, we can, with laser light. So light is the tool small enough to enter and repair and open up. Because when it gets damaged, it gets welded. So hard radiation kind of welds the zip and it just locks up. This is a bacterium, an older cell structure. Before we had the eukaryotic cells, we had the prekaryotic or prokaryotic. Karyos is Greek, we're in Greece. Karyos means nucleus, Kevin in Deutsch. So a true eukaryotic has a nucleus, but a prokaryotic cell has no nucleus. So everything is going on everywhere, and DNA is fighting space with all the other organelles. These are very primitive bacteria, but they're very, very old. The plant is four and a half billion. The bacteria are four billion years old, three and a half billion years old. The oldest organisms living on this planet are bacteria, light harvesting bacteria. They feed exclusively on light, air, and water. That's the raw substance, and out of this they can manufacture protein, fat, sugar, carbohydrates, what have you. Known as alchemy. Transmutation of elements, but you need some fire to do it. These still live in the ocean cyanobacteria, light harvesting bacteria, and they feed on light. Eventually, <coughs> the light harvesting bacteria migrated into the mother cell and became mitochondria. Living inside the mother cell, like parasites, but you would say symbionts, because they feed on the mother cell. <coughs> she does all the hard work, but they supply the energy. Without the energy, she would die immediately. So these are the fire nuclei. These are the powerhouses that supply all the energy to the mother cells. She could not live without her old colleagues because the old bacteria can feed on light, whereas the mother cell can no longer feed on light. Plants have photosynthesis, but animal and human cells have no photosynthesis. 
we cannot eat light, so to say. That's what we were taught. But there will be more here. The mitochondria, the bacteria that became the mitochondria for Dractiv, they kept part of their own DNA. So inside the cell, you would say, yes, I've seen the double helix, the DNA structure. I've seen that many times. But did you know that we have two libraries of DNA in each cell? We have the huge, vast double spiral. But then we have what is known as mitochondrial DNA, which is annular. Just a tiny ring, a couple of rings are in each bacteria, in each mitochondrion. And it only contains typically 32, 33 genes, whereas the big library contains 30,000 genes. But this is a micro-information library that the bacteria kept on their own. They kept the light processing information machine. They kept that from the mother cell. And they still keep it. After three and a half billion years, the bacteria, the mitochondria, are still photoactive. They eat light. And it is known in tissue that is very high in energy demand, brain tissue or heart tissue. And there is a third tissue, but it's only us guys who have it, and it's sperm tissue. Consume enormous amounts of energy. Half of the cell mass is mitochondriac. So half of your brain is mitochondrial. That feeds and eats light. So that's the first step. Now, this tiny little DNA structure is very susceptible to damage. It has no double strand. So if it breaks with a virus, for example, it tends to mutate. And if it mutates too wildly, then it loses its information. And there again, Professor Carroll said, yes, you can actually repair damaged DNA with light. She made a classic experiment, having human tissue in a dish known as a Petri dish, a shallow dish, in a suspension. And it's known that cells will multiply and multiply, keep on multiplying. But in reality, they fall asleep and die. So after typically 30 divisions, human cells will fall asleep and they will die. She had cultures with sleeping, dying human cells. She gave them 10 seconds worth of laser light. And they came awake again and typically lived for another 30 divisions, and when they were about to die, she fed them 10 seconds of light, and off they went, and off they went. So the fountain of youth, which has been spoken of, the Eldorado, the magic, the gods that never died, was connected to light. Because we don't get old from age, we get old from damage. Age in itself is not bad, it's just when you get sufficient amount of damage and malfunction in the system, will no longer work, and the repair mechanism is light. Looking inside the membranes of a mitochondria, Alexandra mentioned it, what is known as the cytochrome complexes, these are protein complexes, some are shuttle complexes, moving inside the membranes. So these are tissue membranes, <coughs> fatty tissues, very high in fatty acid, which also means E2 omega-3, eat your fat, do get fat, because otherwise you don't get photo-optically active. This is optically very active tissue, polarizes the light, but it needs fat to operate. So it's an insulator, it insulates the cells against electrical charge. And here the light is harvested. Light is eaten, and it is transformed into electricity. So like a battery, photoelectrical effect, photons are transformed into electrons and into acidity. Because a plus on the battery also means acidity and a minus means alkalinity. So you now get a battery filled with energy. Each light, the light harvesting bacteria will feed on light, transmit it into energy and say, now what do I do with all this energy? Then I think comes an interesting picture here. Yes, please. Here it is. Professor Carroll said, I have found at least five modalities, five avenues, conduits, where the light energy, the harvested energy can be used, depending on the situation. It was in classical color therapy, light therapy, we learned that orange is good for the tongue, and green is good for the heart, and blue for the brain, and hallelujah. But it doesn't hold water. 
it seems to be a holographic structure where everything feeds on everything at the same time. And depending on the situation, because the cell is intelligent, you feed chemical energy, optical energy, and now you charge the battery. Delta C and delta P, it just means that now the battery is full. So the cell will say, I will use it for a taxi, which is great again, which means to move. So get a taxi, move, <laughs> that is what it means. It says, I need to move. Cells move and move and move. It takes energy. So it says, I will use the light energy to move for motility. Or it says, I will not move, but I need food, but I need to bring the food. And that takes energy to get the weight to here. It says, I want to have children, I want to duplicate, I want to multiply myself, which takes energy. Or it says, I need bacteriophagia, I need to commit suicide, because I've been poisoned, so you better kill me quickly. They're very altruistic, the cells, unlike humans. They say, if I've been poisoned, I'm bad for the system, so please kill me now. It takes energy to live and it takes energy to die. So it spends its energy on a funeral. Or the middle path it says, I cannot use the optical energy. I put it into the bank. I use it for a rainy day. ATP, adenosine, triphosphate, a highly charged molecule that can store energy, that can later on be used. But depending on the situation, is it acidic? Is it alkaline? Is it stress? Is it toxic? Is it undernourished? Does it need oxygen, etc.? The cell will choose. So it will say, yes, I will use this blue light for this or that or that or what you have. Then we come into what is known as modern physics. Quantum physics doesn't exclude classical physics, but it means that, like in a hologram, you have no compartmentalization. You have no parts. There is no up and down in a hologram because all information is being processed at the same time in all parts. So light seems to be holographic. And what Professor Kao said, because I've been visiting her in Moscow, I invited myself as a guest student in Moscow during the last, last time and was accepted. She showed the laboratories and she said, I suspect at least 10 more avenues where the energy, but these are the five clear ones. But you have the psychic phenomena. You have energy conductance, you have the feeling of energy fields. So the cell is capable of a lot of things that we barely have touched. So color therapy, light therapy is now stepping into the holographic age. This is John Hart. He worked with Disney. And you met him, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So Brian, has, he's a saint, mm -hmm. he's a classic. He worked with plants, worked with animals, and he eventually found out that light is so important for the maintenance of biological systems. But some light was better than others. He made some interesting experiments, fertility, daytime rhythms, regrowth of fur, social behavior, etc. All relied on light spectrum color. Color was the software. And he relates an experiment that he did not make, but it became a classic. This is Piccadilly Circus in London. But Piccadilly Circus no longer is a circus. You could circumvent it before, but in the 70s they rebuilt it. So now it's just a peninsula. While rebuilding Piccadilly Circus, in the middle of it still stands the Statue of Eros. Barely outlined, you will see the outline of the statue. That's the Eros statue. So while they were cleaning it up, during winter, of course, not to bother the tourists, they did it in the winter. They cleaned the statue as well. Incidentally, being the world's oldest aluminium statue, because the very first aluminium statue, 1897 something, was made in Piccadilly Circus. But it was messy because the birds were living there, sitting and shitting and living on the statue. So they cleaned it. And finding, midst the winter, that the birds were hatching. Sitting on Eros' shoulders, they were hatching the eggs in the midst of Christmas. And any on authorities would say, hey, hey, stop. Birds are sterile during the winter, aren't they? Birds are only fertile during the summer season. But these birds in Piccadilly Circus were fertile all year round because they were fed monochromatic light. Ooh, ooh, watch this. 
enormous quantity of colored light, neon light, beaming on them. So they would be super fertile. And uh, imagine humans sitting in front of neon, etc., how it affects our body systems. So Jamat worked a lot into this, one of the big pioneers. And he mentioned this, which is not even an experiment, it's an accident. Like many of the good experiments are just accidents. Now we have to change here. This is classical, analog objects. It needs the touch of a human hand. Needs a touch of a loving technician. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, as I said. Chapter 2, second half of the sermon. The human eye, known as the mirror of the soul, today we would say it's the mirror of the brain. The human eye is brain tissue that hands loose, but evolutionary, it's been split up in the brain already in the early stages of the fetus, eye tissue and brain tissue is highly similar. Capable of millions of colors. So you ask, how many colors can a human see? And the answer comes out, easily a million. For a healthy man. If it's a healthy woman, you come up to 10 million. Because you ladies have superior color vision. Due to evolution, also we grew, this is what color which books, we were monkeys living in Africa. We grew hunters, gatherers, but thus we shaped our color perception. Because the men would hunt at night. And at night there's not much color to be seen. They would stay quiet and they would stalk that animal. Because if they talked too much, there wouldn't be any breakfast when they came back. Coming back in the morning, and then the ladies took care of the cooking, and then the men slept. So of course they got defect color vision because they were only up at night, like true rats, lost half of the vision. But the ladies who were up during the day, did the cooking, looking after the children, got a different genetic coding for the color vision. So much of the color vision is coded on the X chromosome. And you ladies have double coding, you have double X, we only have one as pro eyes. So evolution made our eyes different. That's the step. Why is it so important? Why do we feed on light? Then incidentally, boys, there are no lady perfumers, so we have a better sense of smell. Because during the night, stalking, we had to sniff around. So the perfumers are always men. <laughs> but we're not good in color. <laughs> <laughs> Look inside. Light penetrates like a chamber, dark chamber, and here at the rear of the eye, the eyeball, it's about four centimeters in diameter, the whole world is contained without the size of a golf ball. Here you have a very intricate tissue known as the retina, Netzhaut in German. It's just a quarter of a millimeter. The retina, imagine, it's a part of the papers, tenth of a millimeter here. It's a quarter of a millimeter but it is the tissue in the whole body that has the richest percolation of blood. So within one hour, you have five liters of blood passing through a quarter of a millimeter. No other tissue in the body is so richly saturated with fresh blood. There's something very special about the mirror of the brain, the mirror of the soul. Eventually the light ends up in rods and jaws. This is biology. But it was discovered in 2002, very recently, that the ganglion cells are actually capable of reading light. They will read the ambient light, and that the ganglion cell will guide the daytime, nighttime with. And I read two weeks ago in Nature that it's probably also that the horizontal cells are fiberoptically active, transmitting optical information, was discovered two weeks ago. So photobiology is exploding. It is growing and growing. There's so much we do not know. Just like I told you, I have to tell you a bunch of lies because the next generation will laugh at us and say, well, they didn't even know about this and that. So, so much is being discovered in this tiny little layer of neural tissue. Connecting to the brain, relate, relate, relate. The genetic of that body, here it branches out. And at the hind of the brain, the visual process starts. 
But it's also known that seeing is believing. Seeing is largely a mental process. We see what we expect to see. The unknown we cannot see. So it's expected that the visual image which falls here, like a camera, at the back of a camera, only compromises about 10% of the total picture process. But 90% of the image content is mental. It's a brain process. It filters, it rearranges. And we have this in astronomy. Because, yeah, when the light enters, we should actually backtrack. It can be done. So we have some high tech. Looking at the retina, you would say it's wired back to forth because the light has to pass through and eventually gets absorbed because here you have the resolution of a picture. It's like having a camera where you put the film back to front or reading through a paper with the print on the other side. So Mother Nature makes some mistakes. She makes humans at times, actually. <laughs> but this is not in astronomy. Because you get a blurry picture coming in here. It's out of focus. An astronomer can get a very blurry picture, but by processing it with good computer software, they eventually get a super sharp image coming out of a blurry picture. And this is what the brain does. It first receives a very hazy, blurry, unfocused picture, processes it mentally, and then eventually says, now I see. But I can only see what I know. Thus a baby has vision, but cannot see. It sees light, color, shades, moving, but does not know what is this. So seeing is highly mental. And what's that? Recent years have shown that there are so many optical pathways inside the brain. You see, it goes back and forth, midbrain, hypothalamus, brainstem, hindbrain, back to the prefrontal. So these are preliminary estimates saying that 80% of the total information processing in the brain is optically. So seeing is our largest modality for knowing, understanding. You see, I see. Seeing is believing. So very much of our cognitive process rests on visual information. Estimate is today 80%. And it's more and more of these branches are being discovered every year. Here is human brain tissue growing. And there again, it feeds on light. And the better light it gets, the more it grows. This was known long ago that light is important. So looking at color therapy, light therapy, you say, but didn't they know about it? Well, people did, and they didn't. So this is also an early experiment of light and color therapy before lasers were invented. So the glass makers would use precious metals to get the beautiful red, you would use layers of gold. Gold in thin, thin layers creates a very beautiful red. So the master glassmakers would use this in the churches, but the churches were also cathedrals, libraries, hospitals, mental hospitals, and patients were placed in the colored light for color therapy, for light therapy. Here is a German instrument. This is from the 1700s, light therapy again, using a quasi-monochromatic source, again gold, thin layer of gold on a hollow mirror, and it was placed in the sun, the reflection, in the focus you placed the patient, and they were irradiated with a reddish gold light. But crystals are highly selective, which means that we're getting close to monochromatic light. Monochromatic light was very special. Here again, the glass makers. You saw it yesterday. This is Pleasanton's grapery, where he added blue glass and found that the grapes grew like magic. And then he 
how different plants would grow. Then he took his pet dog, in fact. Yes, the dog was very healthy. And then eventually he started to work with humans. He said, yes, humans also react very positively from selective spectral distribution, from using monochromatic, pseudo-monochromatic light sources. Pleasanton's work was observed by an Italian doctor, Ponza. So Dr. Ponza made a clinic that looks like Pleasanton's grapefruit. <laughs> you recognize it here. And said, apathetic, depressed patients, place them in blue. No, sorry, blue for the aggressive, for the maniac. Calm them down. But the studies came from the great place. They used pseudo-monochromatic blue light and you would take the first experiments imitating the great brick, or here is another version, replacing red and blue. Dr. Panza, 1870s in Torino in Italy, nothing was published in English. It's been published in Italian and French, but he never wrote anything in English. His name is nearly forgotten. So let's go on. Ponza, P-O-N-Z-A. P-O-N-Z-A. Yes, Ponza. Uh, I think, was his name. Rudolf Steiner, Austrian, light, color, children needed, pedagogics. He worked with severely handicapped children, what we would today would say ADH children, and mentally handicapped children, autistic children, and said, yes, use pure colors. He used water prisms to get pure color. But he also used the primitive form of fiber optics. Silk is fiber optically very active. Chinese knew about this. So dyeing silk with beautiful colors, you get a fiber optically active tissue. And you can actually feel it on the skin, but silk feels very differently. So Steiner started to work with this with prisms, crystals, and silk. So you know, there's something special about that. And today we would say, yes, it's fiber optically active. It is pseudo-monochromatic. He was an American lady. You recognize her? No, it's not. No, it's Beatrice Irwin. Lady engineer. And I worked with Edison. But she said, why need lamps be so ugly? So technically maladjusted. We need lamps for humans. So she made health lamps. She's written one book called Gates of Light. Fascinating lady, forgotten today. This is 1915, she made these lamps. She mixed crystals. What's your name? Beatrice Irwin. Irwin? Irwin. 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 I've got a beautiful brochure, and there is a website. And if you go into the website, there are at least a thousand titles, books, research papers, and her name is listed there. So people love, can we read about this? So, all the titles are listed on the website, so do get that. Beatrice Irwin is fascinating, wrote several books. She worked with fiber optics, she made lamps with crystals. So she pulverized quartz crystals, gemstones you would call it today, precious stones, and made lamp shapes where she would use crystals and light together to structurize the light but better. Today her name is forgotten, but she speaks about the sedative blue, the recuperative yellow, the stimulant green. Very fascinating. Here's Laura Soma, English lady, Vicky Wall, who was blind. Vicky was blind. I knew her when she was alive. Slightly crazy and a genius. So originally she made just seven bottles. But it's known that liquids, oils, one half is oil, the other half is water, and they separate, of course. In liquids, oils, the interface, you get very interesting reflection phenomena. You can get a purity of color in liquids that you cannot get in pigments. So now we start stepping closer to the pure colors. Very popular orasoma system expanded and expanded. And now Vicky is in heaven, but the colors are still there. Here it is. Let me see. Digital images. What they do to you? Yeah. Don't use digital <laughs> images. This is Norman Rosenthal, who was South African, by the way. He was born in South Africa. His parents moved to 
US and every winter he had the blues. Bad depressions, winter blues, and took his pills and the depressive till a colleague of his says, but Norman, uh, didn't you grow up with light and flowers? Of course I did. Uh, could there be a connection between light and movement? Ah, oh, yes. And he started researching into this and eventually worked with what is known today as light therapy. You have met him, didn't you? Yes, He's no, friend of the family. Yeah. So desk lamps, office lamps, even an alarm could be bought that sets off. So you wake up with a light. Philips Cutlet now, 20 years later, took his patent, and Philips has copied it. So he said, use light to stimulate your brain. But, here comes the but, that white light is very slow. White light is a mixture of all the spectral colors, and using white light is like playing the piano with your elbows. It's <laughs> <laughs> known as white noise. So it's a mixture of information, but most of it cancels out. You wouldn't go to a pharmacist and say, give me all the bottles from all the shelves and mix it, please. You would say, I want this information. I would only want one part of the spectrum. Because the common argument is that white light contains all colors. So you can use white light when you can and you cannot. White light is good for many things. So you would typically spend two hours a day in front of it to boost your brain. But Professor Carroll made an interesting experiment and said, what happens if I did dilute the color? What will happen to it? Here again, a diagram. In a flask, case it vertically, suspension of human tissue, and it is being irradiated from the top and from the bottom. Lambda 2 from the top, and lambda 1 from the bottom. The first experiment, she only has a narrow bandwidth of monochromatic light from one side, and the result is a 100% stimulation of new DNA. Thus, the new tissue that is being made, thus, the DNA that is repaired, the damage, the nerve cells that can grow again. With a highly selective stimulation, you get a 100% improvement in efficiency. Experiment number two. Still keep the narrow bandwidth, but now she adds a second light source, broadband light, which dilutes it or pollutes it even, because the effect disappears. All the following experiments, broadband light, combination of broadband white light, you're down to zero. <laughs> which means white light is good for some time. It's good for regulating your daytime rhythms but white light will never repair your DNA. Mm. That's the trick. The immortality cure is closely related to the precision, and no musician would say, hey, give me some music. Or say, let's mix a C and an E. Does not make a D. Maybe Alexander can help us, but I guess the latest research says it's very narrow band blue light instead of white light. That Runs their circadian. Yeah. It's not just like blue. The ganglia, blue the ganglia cells are triggered by the blue spectrum. And it's a very this. narrow wave band. Narrow wave band. So narrow band light is more precise. I mean, any violin player or any musician or any technician will say, this is what I want. Can you make it precise, please? Um, was that any particular color or? Did it not matter what color she was? That is red. Okay. So red. Those were the lasers, the ruby lasers. Okay. But it proves that this is strange. The laser effect will be there irrespective of color. So as long as you keep a narrow bandwidth, you can have it red or green or blue. It doesn't seem to matter. As long as you keep it pure. Then you may choose if you want it. But the cells eat light. And as long as you can keep it very pure, you get a very interesting situation that DNA is being regenerated. New DNA is made. Now, remember the pictures of the mitochondria, the old light harvesting cells, the bacteria that could feed on light. They would feed on sunlight for three billion years, eat light, and produce proteins and fats and anything. Now they moved into a mother cell like parasites, symbionts, and they cannot eat white light anymore because we have no photosynthesis. 
but they become like spoiled pets, <coughs> just like spoiled pets. If you feed them canned food, they can actually eat. They cannot catch mice anymore. But if you feed them beautifully cooked, they can. So the mitochondria are capable of photosynthesis, provided you give them laser light or monochromatic light. It's the story of the Sleeping Beauty. She slept three billion years, and with the kiss of a laser, she woke up. Wow. And said, I'm not dead. I still have photosynthesis. I'm still eternally alive. And we are the first laser generation. Nobody has ever seen this before. So we're going to make experiments. We need guinea pigs. There will be experiments made here also. So that's the trick. White light is good for many things, but it will not go into the DNA structure. We need that precise tool to come into the nucleus to start working the magic. Here is a spectrum. There you see a thin slice is being cut out. And this is what you have. Uh, Cal Albert has one of these in Vienna, which is a water cooled monster. Uh, but you can cut a thin slice out of the spectrum. There is a hand here. Carl, isn't it true a small portion of the sun's light arrives at the Earth in, in a coherent fashion and that it's exactly the precise size to enter the sun? Possibly. I'm not sure there. So maybe. I mean, there's so much we do not know. Light is also circular polarized. And I guess there is much more information hidden in light. But in classical physics, no. But I imagine there is more to be discovered. Like 2002, new receptors were discovered in the eye that nobody had heard of. So there's probably much more to be discovered. <coughs> Leonardo was interested in this. Artists have been asking, how do I get beautiful colors? Because colors were expensive, they were difficult to mix, and the more you mix them, the darker they get. This is known in watercolor painting in particular. If children start working with watercolors, it becomes very muddy because it all cancels out. Working with pigments, you will end up with a murky brown. Working with light, you will end up with white. But then it is polluted and diluted. Leonardo writes about this. Leonardo wrote a beautiful book, a treatise on painting, Trattato della Pintura, written in the end of the 15th century. So he writes, I had a dream about a color that was so pure that when I woke up I could not mix it because you cannot make it with pigments, the super colors. Newton said, yes, my lad, it is monochromatic. I have proven with a prism. So in 1666, Newton makes the experiment, splitting white light and saying, white is a mixture. And then he put a second prism, and then it says, now it is pure. Now it is monochromatic, dear Leonardo. This is what you saw in your dream. This is what Newton told Leonardo when we were young. That's the way it went. So you said, but where do I find this super light? In nature. There is no laser in nature. Well, there is, actually. Bio laser, you would call it. First of all, the rainbow. The Greeks. Call it Iris. Iris was the bridge between heaven and earth. She was a messenger goddess that brought the messengers from the gods to the humans. And now the prism is a water drop. So millions and billions of water drops are the optical medium. But it is not a color. It is never painted. It is not a pigment. There are more of them. Here, peacock feather. That's a classic. Sorry. That, take that. That worked just as well. This brilliant green of a peacock feather or a mallard duck is monochromatic because protein layers are very cleverly organized and through multiple reflections it acts like an interference filter, a very high resolution. So here you have what we would call a natural laser source. This was known with peacock feathers. The Shah of Iran would sit on the peacock throne embedded in peacock feathers and would receive laser therapy without knowing the name of it. Interesting is, if we take this green feather, peacock, parrot, put it in a microscope, 
If you silvery white, this has no color. So it's just the interference of light, the play of light can make it. There's no way of catching the light, so to say. You cannot paint the light. Here is another example, the scarabs. The Egyptians considered these animals sacred and put them in the sarcophagus. And I would say not because they were sacred, but because they were tiny little laser gadgets. These, yeah. are, these are gratings. If you put them in a microscope, again, they're silver and white, but they're gratings. So you have a serrated surface with tiny little ridges and thus creating the supercolor. <coughs> One more. Crystals. Certain crystals, certain gemstones would produce the supercolors. So some of the painters would use the lapis lazuli, for example, the ultramarine. It was worth its weight in gold because you could produce a resolution, purity, beyond anything. Often gemstones are for ground. Hindus would know this. Old Indian gem therapy. So you would place gemstones on chakra and acupuncture points. Place yourself in the sun and then you would get laser light onto the acupuncture points. It was only used in the temples because big gemstones are expensive. Silver crystals, quartz crystals, lamps, we again also go to work with this primer. Placing a prism in a window will feed your eyes, will feed your brain this super light. That is a connection to heaven, the bridge to heaven. Or oh, here, soap bubbles, Newton's rings, tiny tissues, you have interference, and the Thickness is not uniform, thus the distance for the light ray varies, and thus you get these non colors because there is no color. And you were blowing soap bubbles yesterday. We have an artist here. Let's go. See, there is more. This is monochromatic color. It is the only pin that you can buy that is monochromatic. It was invented in the 80s for cosmetics. But interestingly enough, I worked in perfumery. When you make this brilliant blue color, you have a white crystal powder with a crystal shape. It's a photonic crystal. You mix the white crystal powder with a transparent oil, and the moment they come together, it goes blue. But there is no color involved, just light bouncing in crystal to change the refractive index when you add the oil, of course. Oh, yeah. That's a great thing. And you get selective color stimulation. And a banknote. Swedish banknotes will have many countries will have these. These are holograms, reflection holograms, <coughs> micro gratings on the size of the light waves, so you get a selective <coughs> cancellation, you get destructive and constructive interference, and thus you get brilliant colors coming out. This is a work of Professor Carroll again. She said, working with coherent light, laser light, I found these experiments, Professor Mestre, skin regeneration, tissue regeneration. They even used fiber optics for peptic ulcers. The fiber optics into the tummy, giving them laser light inside the tummy, and found it healed up. Beautiful experiments were performed over and over again burns, heavy burns, soft lasers would generate new healthy skin. New skin was made. So those were the old experiments showing that on an optimum level of typically 100 euros per square meter, you have generation of human DNA. To the right, we have monochromatic, non-laser light, incoherent light. And looking at it, you will see it's actually a bit better. It performs a little bit better than the laser light. That's one advantage. It doesn't have the slow threshold. Since the laser is a bit slow here before anything happens, you need to come up to 12 or 15 mood. And when a chromatic source starts immediately in there, very slow, slow levels. And the third advantage is at high levels, at high light levels, you tend to burn the cells and they're no longer interested. 
But even at high light levels, we don't burn the cell with monochromatic light. So her discovery, this is late 80s, she said, you don't actually need a laser for biological purposes. An engineer will say, I will need it for cutting metal. That's another thing. But for biology, healing, therapy, psychology, etc., we will say monochromatic light is plenty. A laser has three components, three optical dimensions, so to say. It is always monochromatic. It is always polarized, and it is always coherent. But in biological tissue, coherence is lost. Polarization is lost very quickly inside the chaos of the body. But the monochromaticity stays. And she found that the important factor working in therapy is the monochromaticity. And she even put a value at it. She said, as long as you stay below 15 nanometer, it works like a laser. So you see the soap bubbles, the peacock feathers, were natural lasers. The crystals, the gemstones had been there, but nobody ever considered. And today we know, yes, you can use it as a good laser source, and you will wake up your dormant mitochondria, and you can make them come alive and alive again. You mean incoherent light can be polychromatic as well? Pardon? Incoherent light, can, can it be polychromatic as well? Yes. Uh, yeah, always, yes, incoherent light can be polychromatic. But in order to get the laser effect, you need this narrow bandwidth. Mm -hmm. You remember the spike in the bottle, that it has to stay within 50 nanometers. It's like an instrument. If it gets, the window gets too big, I put it this. Do you have a piece of wire in your way? Yes. 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 This is all you get. Okay. But if the window gets too large, the cell will say, what do you mean? More specific, please. Because this is kitchen green, this is mock green. This is what I'm wearing. I'm yellow, I'm blue, I'm not green at all today. Mm -hmm. But this is green. Mm -hmm. This is what you see in a peacock's cell. And philosophically, it means seeing the truth of having lived a life in illusions. Ah, this is what it looks like. Now, Leonardo's dream, a glimpse into paradise. There's the purity of our peace colors. Thanks, sweetest. Thank you. 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 Thank there is a one, Tal Albert has one in Vienna. So we started to make spaceships. There is a science fiction aspect involved. Of you bring laser light to the, out to the outer fringes of the galaxy. Because, like I said, some old stars at the nucleus of the galaxy are monochromatic. So when we were young, we lived nearby monochromatic stars, but now we live here in the diaspora. We've lost a lot of information. So we made little spaceships, filled them with monochromatic light. So there's a client. The client chooses the color because light is food to the brain. And just like the stomach eats food, the brain eats light, but the appetite is highly individual. We all need to eat, but some are vegetarian, and some want fish, and some want their meat rare, and etc. Some want a salad. Same thing with light. So we want red or blue or green or orange. Let the patient choose. This is the idea. When we make the experiments, it's much more democratic. Only one person knows what is your appetite, and that is you. So they can choose it. You see it goes into green. Is choosing green. And then eventually, because these spaceships were bulky, they were 400 kilo, we could never transport them. <laughs> so there was a smaller version, the earlier version, where you just cover the face with what's known as a Gansfeld. Have you been to a planetarium? You will notice that inside a curved space, you lose perspective, you lose size, you lose horizon. You cannot tell the distance. So even inside a small bubble, you get a Gansford. 
And the version that I brought yesterday is even smaller. It's slightly smaller than this. The infusion monochromatic light. And that is part of the experiment. So that's the last. No, there are some more pictures. Here's one of the guinea pigs. With the smaller domes, you can choose. But again, in modern color therapy, it's very much like an appetite. As long as you keep it monochromatic, it may be orange or green. It's up to you. You pick your choice. The effect, the laser repair effect will still be there, irrespective of the color. So she chooses green. You may choose whatever. Some of you already tried it. And there you see it close. So it's like a journey. You can go from ultraviolet to infrared, which is the visible spectrum. And then you can navigate. And another advantage is that the difference between a piano and a violin is on a violin you have an infinite number of positions, which is known as a glissando in music. So you can grade it. And the patient may say, I want my green slightly turquoise. Yes, that's it. And when they find that key note, they start, yes, this is my color. But having seven colors is a very poor piano. You would play power of black sheep, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. But sophisticated say, no, I wanted gold and orange. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm. So since we are so individual, no two fingerprints are the same, no two bacteria are the same, find your own key note, like a tuning fork. Bing, that's your pitch, yes. And saying it's like software to the brain, it's superior software, it's also optical. This is true. You will see a purple that is not a mixture of blue and red, it is purple. And your happy brain will see truth. And truth and beauty and health and wisdom are all twin sisters of Iris. But it also means feeding your beautiful brain good information. It's like in geography. All flat maps are wrong. You go to a travel agent and he shows the map. And he says, yes, I'd like to go to Uganda or to Scotland. And you show the flat map, which is utterly faulty. Everybody knows that the Earth is not flat. But we live in this reality. We're used to it, living in a world of illusions. If you, somebody shows you a globe, and says, hey, yes, it's spheric. Ooh, la, la. And Siberia joins with Alaska. Yeah, yeah, now I understand a few things. So you feed your brain a higher dimension of information. And it will understand, it will remember. It will be remembered, not being dismembered, which is the common state here, but you'll be remembered. Can you always be sure that the patient will uh, choose a color yeah. that's good yeah. for the person? Yeah. Uh, as we heard earlier today, uh, uh, patient who's uh, depressed should not have blue. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's holographic. Yeah. No, listen, I found out, I learned this in England, but classical, and I had so many patients coming back, worked with 25 years, they got well with the wrong colors. Yes. They would come back and you say, my stomach is so much better, thank you for the blue color. And I feel the blue is not for the stomach. And more and more would come back getting well, but with the wrong colors. And eventually, I gave it up. It's a huge chance. It's, it's the relationship of the person to the frequency. The color is inside consciousness. It's not out there. It's in consciousness. It's your relationship with that color. You can show what you perceive as violet to hundreds of different people. And they will all respond differently. They will not respond the same. They will respond differently, even physiologically, you can measure. Then it must be very important to listen closely to the client. Mm -hmm. It's important to listen to them, and it's also important that maybe there are other ways of, of evaluating it. But that's my experience of it. Can we do anything wrong? Not really. You can take too much of it. See. We will make experiments. You may need a short break for a wee wee or need need. In the experiments, a full treatment is 10 minutes. And we don't have time for full treatment. But 10 minutes is what an adult takes once a month. So like a vaccination, you get 10 minutes a month. 
typically three, four treatments and that's it. Then you're upgraded. So you must upgrade your brain to galactic standards. And then it starts working like it should. But it usually works on its own. I needn't tell you how to breathe, for example. Can I breathe wrongly? Well, possibly if you make an effort, but it usually works on its own. Or your heart. Need I control my heart? No, trust your heart, it works. <laughs> And it also introduces working with children an element of freedom, of fun, of democracy. It's your life, your choice. So it's another dimension. This is non-classical optics, so to speak. You asked a very good question. You said, can you do anything wrong? From my experience, in terms of Carl's technology, if the person is driving the car, they will not crash the car first. So they will go where it feels good for them. If you're working very gently with the person, there's less of a chance. But if you're working with a, a cookbook that says uh, everyone's going to respond the same to this, then you may step on their toes unknowingly. So it's, I think it's very important to listen to the person you're working with work very gently. It's kind, of, it's kind of like, how much do you want them to heal? Because when you want them to heal, you are directing the person, and you will, you, if you force them into a color, you put them into a color, they will respond to a, into a color that, that you think of them and not in their color. You may create an effect that is uncomfortable, but it's because you're trying to drive the process, which, and it's, so it's, it's to stand back. I can give an example. A sporty person <coughs> will feel relaxed in that. He loves the storm. Say, hey, that's great. I like that. Word. But if you give them blue, they fall up the walls. They'll get nervous from the blue. So we're not standard people. That's the standard model doesn't apply anymore. There's so individual, there's so many levels involved. And also, color and light is a non-verbal communication. It communicates with the reptile brain, and the reptile brain doesn't speak English nor Swedish. So you're communicating with an old biosystem. You're communicating with the mitochondria, and they're three billion years old. And they're not logical. This is beyond logic. There's so much that we do not know. Because according to logic, we shouldn't be alive. But still, we're alive somehow. <coughs> and I'm just as surprised as you, because I was trained in classical phototherapy, color therapy, but the rules change. And that's like in physics. Quantum physics doesn't contradict classical physics. So Einstein doesn't contradict Newton. It's just that Newton is only a sub-compartment of the larger holographic system. still exists. But there is much, much more information. There is so much we do not know about light and humans. It is also a dimension of mystery or magic that I believe must be there. It is beauty, it's fun, it's magic. It's not logic, it is mythological. Then comes the fun part. If we switch on some light, please, here. And we switch this cancel up. <coughs> Isn't she a good technician? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Suggestion. You split up two and two with friends you do not know. And then spend a few minutes, make a classical diagnosis. What color would you need? We can discuss it together. Change roles, patient changes.